Hi y'all, it's Kayla Jackson from Round Rock, Arizona for the Creative Cowboy Podcast. Today we are talking about the creative economy on the Navajo Nation. The creative economy it encompasses all of cultural goods that is sold here on the Navajo Nation. It could be silversmithing, rug weaving, your local food vendor, to your leather makers, to everything in the realms of the cultural goods. And here on the Navajo Nation, we have a vast variety of that sort. And people have been selling their cultural goods to people around the world for generations and generations. And today we have a world-renowned metalsmith and jeweler, Shane Hendren, a good friend of mine, I might add. He's the only four-time artist of the year. He has served on the Indian and Arts and Crafts Association. He is an outstanding father, a cowboy at heart, and where he sees the creative economy in the future and how we can expand and grow the creative economy here on the Navajo Nation because it is so important that we keep striving for the best and always be a force to be reckoned in the contemporary art world. Okay, Shane, so tell me about the time that you sat on the Indian and Arts and Crafts Association. I know you've sat on their board before, and you've always had a really true impact because you've always wanted us as Native Americans to be successful as artisans. Tell me about that. So um, the Indian Arts and Crafts Association was formed in 1974, and uh, in the entire time that it existed, it was the only organization of its kind. And what I mean by that is it was formed by uh, artists. It was formed by dealers. It was formed by gallery owners. It was formed by museum professionals. It was formed by suppliers. It was formed by everyone in the business. And primarily the reason why it started in the early 70s is the imports, the, the knockoffs were so bad in the early 70s They felt like they needed to form this group to protect the industry. So this common goal of how do we protect Indian art and how do we ensure that our collectors get the real thing was the foundation or one of the foundations for the forming of the Indian Arts and Crafts Association. And uh, I've been I've been blessed to know a lot of the founding members and understand where they were coming from. Because um, <clears throat> that was also the time when artists were beginning to be recognized by name. Like they were starting to, uh, you know, like Ben Nighthorse and, and, uh, and Harvey Begay and, and uh, different artists were, they were developing a name. And because they were developing a name, people were knocking their work off. They were stealing their, their designs, if you will. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of funny because over the years, my thoughts on that whole idea of you're stealing my, my designs has kind of evolved to the point where everything is a stolen idea in some, in some way or another. Mm -hmm. It's just to what point are you stealing it, you know? And with the copyright laws and everything, you can steal anything. You just got to change it just enough that, you know... 10% Yeah. 10% or whatever that rule is and but the issue they were having is not only were they taking their ideas but they were painting their name on it and selling it as though it was their work mm-hmm. and a lot of that work was being done overseas and everything and and this is the thing that I I want to make clear this is what a lot of people fail to understand about um the whole knockoff deal no matter where you go in the world and this is, we'll, we'll speak specifically about jewelry. Mm-hmm. No matter where you go in the world, the materials are going to cost you the same price. You're not going to get a better price for silver in Vietnam or in Bali than you are in Albuquerque, New Mexico. It's a worldwide product. And it sells for the same price no matter where you are. So in order to get a cheaper product, the only way you get it cheaper is to pay lower man hours Mm. you pay the people who make it less and that's and that's the reason why we had so many jewelers for so long was because we were cheap labor Mm -hmm. making making cheap jewelry for an end for for a marketplace that demanded it you know back in the 60s you know 
the the late fifties. It actually it started with the Fred Harvey company. You know, they they needed cheap jewelry to sell to the tourists that were riding the trains, and the Navajos were the cheap labor to make it. The fact that we were very highly artistic and creative was a plus. Yeah. And so it it got built on that. But then when you get into the late sixties, early seventies, what happens is. Um, it becomes so popular. You know, you see Janis Joplin, you see, you know, Jimi Hendrix, you see all these people wearing Indian jewelry, Mm -hmm. and there's this huge demand. Well, at that same time, you have the American and Indian movement and stuff, Mm -hmm. and natives are beginning to realize, hey, I'm worth more than what you're paying me. They're starting to stand up and demand, you know, more money. Mm -hmm. And the profiteers, if you will, they... They're like, well, we're not going to pay you, so we're just going to go to Asia where we have cheaper labor to make the same thing. And, and it started flooding into the country. And the Indian Arts and Crafts Association was the, they were the, they were the uh, guard, guardians of the gate, if you will. Um, you know, you, ha- you had to be vetted if you were going to be a member of the organization. It didn't matter what part of the industry you were in as an artist or a gallery owner or museum professional. You had to provide documentation. You had to have uh, people um, recommend you, like write letters of recommendation, all this stuff to guarantee that you were not going to, you weren't joining the organization to legitimize your company that you were selling ripoff, knockoff stuff. And um, so that was the roots of it. And then over the years, it became a, an organization that really helped to raise up the uh, recognition of individual artists. That, and that's the reason why the Indian Arts and Crafts Association started the Artist of the Year Award. Because, um, because in the Indian art business, it's kind of, it's a real tricky deal. Um, a lot of these Indian art shows have judge competitions. Well, most of the time, the judges are either gallery owners or collectors or museum professionals, sometimes other artists. But the fact of the matter is, no matter who it is, they're human. And, you know, we, none of us are perfect. But people recognize people's work. We all create styles that become recognizable. At least, I think it's more by accident. We, we all sort of fall into ruts and make the same stuff over and over. Mm -hmm. So it, becomes our style yeah but anyhow um the problem you run into is is uh if you're a gallery owner or you're a uh collector um it behooves you to protect your investment if you will so if if you're judging and there's three pieces there and one of them is somebody that you collect or somebody that you represent there's a greater likelihood that you're gonna like their stuff more because you already like it enough to buy it yourself Mm -hmm. you know so i'm not going to say that they're outrightly going in there and saying well joe benali's winning because i rep him (laughs) because i collect his stuff you know but you know, there's a little bit of that in, in the back of your mind. And, I, and I've judged. I've judged a lot of shows, including Santa Fe Indian Market. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I can say this with that awareness. When I look, I know, I know who did... Most of the time, I know who did what because I recognize their stuff. Mm-hmm. And, and you have to, as a judge, in my opinion, you have to put all that exten- external information that you have away. And just judge it on the individual pieces, Mm -hmm. which is what I've always tried to do. I've just tried to look at each and every piece on its own merit. And I've had some bad experience with other judges and stuff where they've, you know, or people who were in charge at shows who told me that my judging was no good. And I told them, well, don't bring me back. They didn't. (laughs) (laughs) But, But that's a different deal, so... So the Indian Arts and Crafts Association was this, or was this group that was formed to protect the Indian art business. And, and it was formed so that everyone in the business could be heard. And uh, 
I really didn't know anything about the Indian art business. <clears throat> I was very naive. And uh, I went to school at the Institute of American Arts in 1989. And uh, to tell you how naive I was, I'll, I'll put it like this. Everybody said, you got to do Santa Fe Indian Market. And I was like, what the hell is Santa Fe Indian Market? And here, you know, it had been the biggest show for Indians ever, still <laughs> is. And they're like, you know... If you want to be a legit artist, you got to do Santa Fe Indian Market. And I was like, well, how do you, how do, you do it? And they said, well, you got to apply. So I applied, and, you know, and I didn't even try hard. And I got in mm -hmm. and, you know, I showed up late and I had a great show and I thought it was all, you know, rock and roll and rodeo from there on. <laughs> Never have another poor day. But uh, as when I was living in Santa Fe going to school, I really got a crash course in the business because while I was there, it was booming. I mean, there was galleries everywhere. Every Friday night, there was no less than 10 gallery openings. And and I used to live on, you know, cheese and salami and, you know, whatever else they put out. Was, we just, you know, we'd go downtown and we'd just have fun. And back then, you know, they served a lot of liquor and stuff and everything at gallery openings. It was They were all just big parties. Mm -hmm. And um, when I started learning and meeting other artists and seeing things and then other older artists started advising me and uh and i kept hearing over and over about not getting caught in the trap you know and i was like okay what is the trap and it, it was like well you know these galleries they want to get you under contract and then they own you and then you know they'll they'll loan you money and everything but then you don't realize they're charging you interest and it, you end up upside down and now you're giving them all your paintings for free because you owe them or whatever. And, and I, and I would always look back and I'd be like, you know, that it's a screwed up system because I know all these artists, world famous artists who were broke, you know, living in apartments or, you know, sleeping on somebody's couch or whatever. But the gallery owner had a Mercedes and lived in a freaking mansion, you know? Yeah. And, and I thought to myself, I, I don't want to be that guy, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I listened to what these guys were telling me because they were living it. And, and a lot of it had to do with substance abuse and everything, you know? Yeah. They, were, they were, you know, it's like trying to fight a boxing match with one arm tied behind your back when you have, you know substance abuse issues but they uh they taught me a lot and and what i learned was i guess the most important lesson i got out of it was everybody was sitting around bitching and complaining but nobody was doing nothing and i come from a family that um for lack of a better term we're doers um I, I grew up on ranches my whole life and grew up with livestock. There's no sleeping in. There's no, you know, if, if it, if it got cold last night, you got to go cut ice, you know, so then horses and cows can drink. And so I was raised to be a doer and, uh, I got tired of listening to everybody bitch and complain. Mm -hmm. And I started asking, well, what are you doing about it? What are you doing about it? And I'm full of, I'm full of, great bullshit ideas just like anybody else mm -hmm. and I spent many a night you know preaching my sermon yeah and uh and then one day you know um S Silver Sun uh gallery in Santa Fe it used to be on Kenyon Road Deanna Olson was the owner and um she had a deal on one of her uh countertops that was an IACA brochure. And well, she had a bunch of them because IACA used to make these brochures about how to buy Indian art, what to look for, all these different things. And she had, uh, she had these brochures from IACA on her countertop. And uh, I'm a visual person. They had cool pictures on them and everything. Mm -hmm. And I used to, if it was free, I was collecting it and looking at it, whatever it was. And so I picked these brochures up and I was looking at them. And then I got to looking at what is this IACA business, you know. And, and then I got to looking around 
And I realized that there were certain artists that were quote unquote IACA artists of the year. And they were all people that I admired and respected. And so then I started asking, well, how do you win artist of the year? How do I become artist of the year? And they're like, well, you have to join the Indian Arts and Crafts Association. And I was like, okay. And, you know, that was just one thing running into another thing. And um, so I started looking into joining the organization, which was headquartered here in Albuquerque. And um, my wife at the time, who is probably the social butterfly of all social butterflies, when she started networking or looking into things I mean we couldn't go anywhere where people didn't know her well she starts running down what all this is and everything because my thing was I want to be artist of the year but I got to join the IECA to do that what is this all about you know I I I don't I'm not interested in buying an award I don't you know Mm -hmm. because there's that too you know and um and I don't want a I don't want a participation trophy. If I win an award, I want it to be a legit deal. Mm-hmm. And so she starts looking into all that and everything. And so I join the organization, and then I find out that they have uh, board meetings and and different things. And uh, the the thing that I really got out of it was they had two shows a year. They were wholesale shows, and. Uh, At the time, I think I did do the most shows I ever did in one year was 14, I think. And um, I had already been doing um, the uh, the American Craft Council shows back east. And at the time, I think I was the only native doing them. And uh, they were wholesale shows. I understood the wholesale process. You know, you make something, you sell it at a reduced rate to a retailer who's going to resell it. And the reason why I liked that was... Because at the time I was young and full of energy and I could make, I just, I was in my studio 27 hours a day because I loved what I was doing and I could just crank it out. And to me, wholesale was a great thing because they did all the marketing. They did all the advertising, you know. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to worry about any of that. I wasn't interested in pounding my own drum or, you know making my own TV commercials or whatever, you know? <laughs> so the retailer would take care of that for you. And so IACA had these had these wholesale shows, so I started doing their wholesale shows. And then through their wholesale shows, I developed a whole other network. And then I realized there was people that were members of this organization that I didn't even know were members, you know? And, and I didn't understand it until much later on. Then I understood why they kept it on the down low. Because once somebody found out you were an IACA member, they thought you were like the art police. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if they if they had a personal problem with this artist or this gallery, that they came to you and you fixed it. <laughs> so as time went on, I learned that's, that's why a lot of people kind of kept it quiet. Because they got tired of people wanting them to solve their problems instead of them taking care of their own business. But anyway, so uh, we... Uh, we did those wholesale shows for a while, and then, uh, and then I uh, was asked to serve on the board mm-hmm. because um, the board the board had to be had to consist of a certain number of artist representatives, certain number of gallery representatives, museums, wholesalers, retailers. It, every aspect of the industry had to be represented by the board, and and I was pretty vocal about about my opinions and everything Mm -hmm. and so I kind of got told you got a big mouth to use it come sit on the board and so I did and I served as a as a general board member for a couple of years and then uh, we uh, I was asked if I would run for an office on the board and um, it kind of kind of took me back to high school and FFA you know Mm -hmm. 4-H and it's like man you know it's one thing to be a board member, but to be an officer, that's a lot of freaking work, you know? Mm-hmm. And I was, and I was working, I was doing a lot of my own work at the time and my kids were rodeoing and everything. I had plenty of stuff on my plate, but, but I, I asked myself, you know, if I don't do this, who's going to do it? Mm-hmm. And 
if I don't do this, who's going to represent me? You know, because I looked at the membership and I looked at the industry and there's not very many people like me. I mean, uh, within the business itself, it's a very small business, but within that business, I'm an even smaller percentage of that business. And, and what I mean by that is, um, at the time and still today, um, there are very, very few native artists who make 100% of their living off of their art. It's very, very small. Um, in most cases, uh, a native artist is married to somebody who has a really good job who can pay the electric bill and keep food in the refrigerator while they ply their trade. And hopefully they create stuff that the market likes and they'll be able to, to sell it. Um, or they come from a per cap tribe and a per cap tribe is a tribe that, uh, their tribal members get money at different times of the year to sustain, to, sub, to, su to sustain them, to keep them going. And, uh, you know, so they can afford to do their art because the tribe is filling their refrigerator and keeping their lights on. Or, uh, or you know, some of them, uh, they just, I don't know how to explain it other than they just have money. You know, they come from either parents or, or whatever that, I mean, there's very few of them, but there's some trust fund Indians out there. Yeah. <laughs> and... And yeah, and, and they've, they can afford to do art, mm -hmm. you know, because they don't have to work. They don't have to. So the number of artists that were like me, that all I did for a living was art, is a very, very tiny percentage of the industry. And for a guy like me, it was ultra important that the best be done for the industry if I was going to survive. And when I joined board and when I, did, when I told them, yes, I'll run for office... I told them I'm doing this 100% selfishly because if I succeed, we all succeed. If we can keep, keep the Shane Hendren boat floating, then every other boat will be, be afloat. Yeah, because cause I'm in the toughest position as an artist. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't have nobody propping me up. It's all, it's either sink or swim. You know, it's like the story of my life. I was, you know, I'm in it to win it and I'm all in it. Yeah. And so... So I ran for uh, vice president that first go around, and uh, I was blessed to to have the opportunity to work with Deanna Olson, who who I was already friends with, mm. and uh, Deanna and her partners over the years. I mean, it's a it's a fantastic story, and I'm I'm not going to tell Deanna's story right now, but I I have a great admiration for her. She's a school teacher, and um, and I don't think I'm I don't think I'm talking out of school when when I say that. You know, she's a she's a multimillionaire now from not teaching school, but from the Indian art business. Mm -hmm. And she did it with a lot of integrity. And the most important thing is she did it to support artists. I've never I've known a lot of gallery owners. I've owned a, known a lot of wholesalers because she had both. She had a gallery. She had galleries and she had a wholesale business. And I don't know of another one personally that did more for her artist than she did mm -hmm. i mean bought them clothes fed them you name it she she did it for him over the years you know she'd give them materials you know and and some sadly some of them took the money and run so to speak mm -hmm. but but her heart and not just her but her partners as well it was it always came from that place and that's why i was always drawn to her not to mention the fact that, you know, she uh, she was a uh, Midwest farm girl that grew up tough, and mm -hmm. you know, I I could relate to her on that note too. You know, she she walked uphill both ways to school in the snow every year. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, she was a doer. Mm -hmm. You know, and and uh, and I'll always have a lot of respect for her because uh, because she was she didn't want to be on the board anymore mm -hmm. and she had served on the board before and, and she said I'll serve she said I'll run for president if you run for vice president she said so that I can teach you 
the ins and outs of this. Mm -hmm. Because she said, this thing will eat you up and spit you out. And I was young and stupid, and I thought, no, it's bulletproof. Hell, I spent a lot of years riding bulls, and they couldn't kill me, so I figured, <laughs> how's the Indian art business going to kill me? <laughs> but little did I know. Uh -huh. um, it they they did not succeed, but there were, there was definitely some attempts. But yeah. but uh, it's funny because uh, when I came on, um, we we had already started an initiative um, to get the Indian Arts and Crafts Act changed, because the Indian Arts and Crafts Act had been in, in existence for a number of years, and that's a federal law that is supposed to protect Indian art. Well, in this great big thick document. There were uh, a few lines in there that made it essentially worthless. And one of the lines was that um, the only uh, legal entity that could investigate uh, claims of fraudulent Indian art was the FBI. Okay? Mm -hmm. And then one of the other lines was something to the effect of the only way that an investigation of fraudulent Indian art could be undertaken or initiated was at the behest of the director of the Department of Interior. Well, the de director of the Department of Interior has a lot of stuff on his plate. The last thing he's worried about is, you know, somebody sold you a knockoff Pendleton mug, you know? So, we're going to get into the dirty side of the Indian art business. Mm -hmm. The Indian art business has been used for a lot of years as a way to launder money whether it was for drugs or whatever. It, it used to be a very highly cash business. So it was a great way to clean your money up. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and, uh, and many other nefarious things. It, it was used as a, as a front for, for a lot of those things. And people are smart. People know where the loopholes are. Mm -hmm. And they knew that this law existed but this law was worthless yeah. and they became multimillionaires. You know, that's what Gallup was built on. That's what Santa Fe was built on. Sadly, mm -hmm. you know, because they knew, you know, we can put up a gallery and we can stock it full of knockoff import stuff and sell it as the real thing, you know, and make buku bucks and nobody can touch us. Nobody can do anything to us. Because here's a scenario of what would happen. I go into a store and I buy my genuine Indian handmade mug. Mm -hmm. And I get home and my neighbor, Billy Joe Bob, who knows way more about Indian handmade mugs, looks at it and he says, you know, I think you got a Chinese made mug. And he's like, no, no, I bought it from Joe Blow Gallery in Santa Fe. It's got to be real. The, the girl who sold it to me said it's the real deal. And he says, no, he says, look, this is wrong with it. That's wrong with it. So I go back and I go to Santa Fe and I tell him, hey, I want my money back because you said this was this or whatever. And they're like, no, sorry. Sorry, buddy. So I go to the police. And they say, well, might be a knockoff. I don't know. But it's not our jurisdiction. Can't help you. Try the state police. Try the county sheriff. All of them. It's not our jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. Hell, I could go all the way to the FBI and say, they sold me a fake mug, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And the FBI is going to say, sorry, can't help you. There was nobody to turn to. There was no way to get help. Mm -hmm. And unless the law was changed. So we started lobbying. We started lobbying on the state level. We started lobbying on the, uh, on the federal level. And we, uh, we sent the president, the um, uh, Nana Ping was the president before Deanna. Mm -hmm. We sent him to Washington to lobby, to, to speak before Congress. It's on the congressional record mm -hmm. about all this stuff we're talking about because it was getting so bad, the, the knockoffs and, and the illegitimate stuff, that even the, nav the, the natives couldn't tell the difference. They were buying the knockoffs and believing it was the real thing. I mean, it was, it was crazy. Yeah. And it wasn't just jewelry. I mean, jewelry was the bulk of it, but it wasn't just, I mean, it was everything. It was paintings. It was pottery. It was yeah. everything, rugs, all of it. It, you know, 
there was nothing that was sacred to these people that were just there to make money. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it really hurt me as an artist because it was already, at that time I was of the opinion that you shouldn't take somebody else's idea and make it your own. And every time I would come up with a new idea, 10 guys would be, they'd be making the exact same thing at the next show. And I'd be like, what the hell? Mm-hmm. And they I got to eat too. You know? <laughs> and I couldn't argue with them. Mm-hmm. You know? It's like, geez whiz, give a guy a little credit. Yeah. But, but what made it worse though is they might be, you know, we, I might come up with a new idea at the herd and then they're making the same thing at Indian Market seven months later or whatever. But what made it worse was I come up with a good idea at the herd. But by the time Indian Market comes around, Every gallery in town is full of it. Mm. So they were pretty much everyone was taking it. Yeah. yeah. And and that was taking food out of my refrigerator. Yeah. Because I felt like I had to get X number of dollars for whatever I made. I knew what I was worth. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't going to back up because that's what I had in it. That's what it was worth. Because my my dad and my brothers, they all work construction. I knew I can go tomorrow and I can go well for 50 bucks an hour. I choose to make jewelry. I choose to make art. I should be able to make that same living doing my art as they do welding or building buildings. Mm -hmm. You know, why should I, because I choose to be a creative person, take less? Doesn't, didn't make sense to me. And I still don't understand why people do it. It blows my mind. Mm -hmm. I just don't understand why creative people are willing. I, I do understand why, because we're passionate and we care about we, what we do and we love it and that's what fuels our fire. But but I did work construction for a while and I made a lot of money. And I missed making art. Mm-hmm. So I came back to it. But anyhow, um, the IECA deal, so so we, we started lobbying and everything to change the Indian Arts and Crafts Act. And then we got other organizations to, to get on board with us and everything. But one of the biggest things that really helped us was a lady named Wendy Rosen. Uh, Wendy runs the, uh, I can't remember now, Craft, I think she owns Craft Magazine. But she used to put on these shows back east, um, not the... Uh, I can't, the Rosen Group. She owns the Rosen Group. They put on these wholesale shows. Well, their artists were starting to experience the same thing that we were experiencing. They were getting their stuff knocked off like crazy. You know, um, like say a, a glass artist comes up with an idea and it and it's a great idea and everything. Well, six months later, it's it's in J.C. Penney's, you know, being made in Taiwan. Mm-hmm. And that artist... Because, you know, they changed just one little thing about it or whatever. That artist, he never gets any money, never gets any recognition, you know. But but the money makers, you know, they're, they're filling their pockets. So Wendy did this tour where she went across the United States. Because a lot of people aren't aware of this, but national parks, they have gift shops and everything. Well, there's a, there's a federal mandate that says that they have to buy crafts from local artisans okay Mm -hmm. and she knew this and she started back east um like in kentucky and and everything where i can't remember exactly but they should have been buying stuff from local craftspeople according to this federal mandate but she went in there and everything they were selling was made in china or or imported Mm -hmm. for the most part 99 percent of it and then they might have one little thing over here from some local artists. And so she started inquiring. She started asking questions. So she takes it upon herself. I can't remember who she was friends with, Barbara Walters or some famous news person. Mm-hmm. And she uh, she gets to the Grand Canyon and uh, she says, I want to see your genuine, handmade, authentic Navajo jewelry. And they said, okay. So they took her over to this case and in this little tiny spot on the bottom, you know. <laughs> on the bottom. Yeah, right there. That's all of it. 
this entire full store full of millions of dollars worth of merchandise. And that right there was, and, and this hit home with me because my dad, when he used to trade, the Grand Canyon was one of his main buyers. Mm. So she peels the onion and what she finds out is most of the, most of the, uh, the gift shops and everything were owned by like two or three uh, companies because the federal government no, no longer ran their gift shops. They, they sold that to these companies. So twofold, now that law doesn't apply directly because it's not the federal government doing it. It's this subcontractor doing it. Hmm. And so Wendy, you know, God bless her, you know, she got pissed and calls up her friend in the news media and says, hey, you got to do something about this. And then there was this huge uh, TV campaign, this Made in America campaign and everything. Mm-hmm. And, um, and because we were doing what we were doing, Wendy got wind of that, and, and we started working together on different things. And uh, she even, in her shows for, for a period of time, she had a, a, a section for Indian artisans mm-hmm. and everything. Because, you know, to do one of those shows is tens of thousands of dollars. When you set up a booth there, it's got to be gal. It, it's essentially a gallery, mm-hmm. and like I, because I had done those shows, I knew you had to deal with the unions. You had to, you know, everything had to be crated and ready to set up. It was, it was a, it was a tough deal, mm-hmm. and um, so a lot of our IACM members had opportunities to do her shows because of that, um, but. It was really a tough, tough deal because uh, we started, uh, the Indian Arts and Crafts Association, we started doing these things that we called, um, uh, I can't remember now, uh, town, they're like town hall meetings. Mm. But um, we were trying to raise awareness that the Indian Arts and Crafts Act needed to change. Mm-hmm. And we were trying to raise awareness that the reason why tourists aren't buying as much and the reason why they're not coming to Santa Fe as much or New Mexico as much is because they feel like they're they're uh, they're getting ripped off because they are mm-hmm. and if you want that revenue back you're gonna have to do something to to fix that so uh, so we started doing these town hall meetings and everything and um, and and I pissed off a lot of people because uh, I called a lot of people out, mm-hmm. and um, and a lot of people didn't like it because I was interfering with their cash flow. Mm-hmm. A lot of uh, people that I respected in the past, I found out were part of this whole import deal and everything, and I couldn't I couldn't respect them anymore. You know, and I felt like, you know, you've lied to me all these years. I, I, I came to you and expressed my feelings and told you what I was dealing with. Here I am, an artist trying to make a living, trying to support my family. And, you know, you were supposedly right there in the same boat, felt the same way. But then come to find out, you're, you're one of them. <laughs> and it was, it was, uh, it was kind of tough, yeah. you know, because, um, uh, it, I really saw the ugly side of the Indian art business. Mm-hmm. Like, really understood, you know, what was... By this point in my life, I really... I could see how, how gallery owners would encourage people's substance abuse problems so they could take advantage of them. Mm-hmm. Um, I could see how, you know collectors were manipulating things to protect their investments you know i i i was aware of um how certain people were blacklisted and and held out of certain shows because i was one of them Mm -hmm. you know santa fe indian market kicked me out one time and i didn't get to show for like three years until the until the political uh 
mood changed about me. But um, and and those were tough years because I I couldn't do my art. I mean, I didn't have a way. I had to go work because mm-hmm. I, you know, and and that had to do with me getting a divorce. That didn't even have to do with my opinions of the art business. It was because the quote unquote organization chose my ex wife over me, hmm. and you know, shame on them, because an organization should rep- represent all people, not pick and choose. You know what I mean? Yeah. Anyhow, that's a mute point, but um, so. We were lobbying in the state of New Mexico for a number of years and uh, trying to get the law changed in New Mexico because in addition to the Indian Arts and Crafts Act being a terrible law, um, Arizona and New Mexico had bad laws too. And one of the laws in New Mexico was at the time, you could sell up to $200,000 worth of illegitimate Indian art and it was a misdemeanor. Now keep in mind that that would never go to court anyway because as soon as you said it was Indian, it falls under the Indian Arts and Crafts Act, and it's nobody's jurisdiction, you know? But they legalized theft. Everything else in the state of New Mexico had a $500 cap. If if you defrauded somebody at $500 or more, it was a third-degree felony. But if it was Indian art, you could defraud somebody up to 200000 <laughs> Essentially, you're telling people, rob them blind. You know, and you're state sanctioned to be thieves. Mm-hmm. And and it really hurt me because, you know, I grew up with uh, former Governor Bruce King, Tony and Naya. You know, I grew up knowing all these people that I had a great deal of respect for. And, and none of them were directly involved in what we were doing. But I felt like my, my uh, public representatives weren't representing me because they kept putting our stuff in committee. You know, there were... There were state representatives and state senators and stuff that made comments like, why are we, we don't want to talk about Indian knickknacks, you know, when tourism is one of the top three industries in the state. And they kept putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. And, you know, we kept pressing and pressing. And uh, under Governor Bill Richardson's uh, um, tenure, I was appointed to, uh, I can't even remember what it's called, the Indian Arts and Crafts uh they formed a, a committee and I was one of the appointees that was involved in, you know, looking into this kind of stuff. And uh, finally, we got, finally we got the law changed. But I mean, it, it took way longer and way more effort than necessary. Mm-hmm. But one of the saddest things was, is I found out that one tribe in New Mexico was against it, was against this change in the law. And I'm not going to name that tribe, but... It really hurt me when I found out a tribe wanted to continue to keep that law as it was. And then when I looked at their artisans and what they were producing, it made perfect sense to me. Because they were essentially ripping off the public, you know. They were bringing, they were bringing in imported hishi and stuff from the Philippines and selling it as their own work, you know, and, and selling plastic as, as genuine turquoise and, and everything. So, of course, they didn't want that law changed because they were benefiting from it, too. Mm-hmm. And, and I've told many of them, you know, you're cutting your own throat. Mm-hmm. You're delegitimizing your own deal here by doing that. And you can't do that. Eventually, it, it, the money runs out. Nobody's going to believe you. Nobody's going to want your stuff, which is pretty much proven true. But um, so because of these town hall meetings, we were bringing a lot of attention to what was going on. People were out there starting to ask questions and everything. What I didn't know at the time, but I learned very quickly, was a lot of the Indian art businesses were owned by uh, Middle Eastern people. And, I don't know how to say this. It, It was explained to me that much like people in the drug business used the Indian art business as a way to launder money. It was a way for them to raise money for organizations they believed in, that they supported, like the Taliban. So buying illegitimate Indian art from these groups was supporting the guys who were shooting our soldiers, who we were fighting against in the Middle East. 
And I took that very personally because I come from a family of soldiers. You know, we're multi-generational. I mean, before we could even vote, we were fighting for this country. Mm-hmm. And, and it really hit me hard. And then Deanna and I started receiving death threats mm-hmm. from these very same people. And we got told by people in the know, um, law enforcement people that knew about what they were doing and everything, um, that we should take these threats seriously. Because, uh, and, and they told us about a case where a gallery had been called out for, uh, for selling, and this is an interesting story, what I remember of it, but um, they'd been called out. So it brought a bunch of public attention to the gallery. So this gentleman that was running the gallery, who was from, from uh, can't remember now, he was, from, he was from the Middle East. They called him back, his brothers did, and they killed him. They beheaded him. That's how they solved the problem. Hmm. And they explained to us, they said, if they'll kill their own brother, killing you ain't, it ain't no big deal. And uh, so, yeah, it was uh, it was real. It was a real weird time. And I served on on the board. I served my time on the board as president. And one of the things that I'm the most proud of is while while I was an officer on the board, we had these programs we called the uh, the uh, uh, the business of art seminars is what they were. And we brought in people to help people understand tax issues, uh, grant writing, um, how to put a business plan together, how to get a business loan, um, how to do basic uh, accounting and keep your books. Um, The business of art also went over other avenues that you could pursue to sell your work and everything, Um, help people understand better the wholesale process. And also understand that like when you sold your stuff to a, a trader in Gallup, for example, you were selling at a fraction of wholesale because they were going to wholesale it again. So you're getting even less than, than you should be. Mm-hmm. And, um, and honestly, some of our members didn't like some of the stuff we were doing with the Business of Art seminars. Mm-hmm. But, um, but I feel like I positively impacted a lot of my fellow artists because... I can't tell you how many of them who did attend those seminars and everything came back and they were like, I never knew that. I didn't, I, I didn't know how to price my work. Mm -hmm. I thought I just, this is, I've had so many people tell me this. I didn't know how to price my work. I would walk into the establishment and I would say, I have these bracelets to sell. And they would say, uh, I'll give you, $10 $10 a piece for them or whatever. And and if I did counter and say, well, I need a little more than that, they would just say, take it or leave it. And it's, it's a sad deal. What are you going to do? You know, when you got a baby in the car and, you know, you're running on empty and electricity's been off for a month, you know. Mm-hmm. People are in a tough spot. They just took it, not realizing that they were losing it on every turn Mm -hmm. and until they took those classes. And and now I look at so many of my fellow artists and I see the positive impacts that it's had. And and even even people that didn't attend those business of art seminars, one of the things that one of the ways that it had great impact was it got us talking about our art as a business Mm -hmm. more so. I mean, now it's common. Now I can talk to my fellow artists and it's like, you know, we talk about things like where you're getting your supplies, what the, you know, who, who's buying, who's paying fair prices, all these different things, you know. Whereas before, it, it was a strange world because it was like nobody talked about it. It was like, you know, it was a taboo subject. You couldn't talk about oh, how much, how do you, how do you price that? How, you know. Mm-hmm. How much how much does that cost? I mean, artists wouldn't even ask each other, well, how much do you charge for that? Mm-hmm. You know, where did you get that good turquoise or whatever? It was always, everything was a secret. Yeah. But then after we had them seminars and after that period of time, 
now I don't feel uncomfortable talking to, to my fellow jewelers and asking them, you know, where did you source that? Mm-hmm. You know, what did that cost you? Because of the internet, I can go find it anyway. Yeah. I mean, I'm, go- I'm going to find out. You yeah. can either tell me or I'll just Google it. <laughs> but yeah. anyhow, so, so, the, so that was my, essentially that was my time with IECA. That's what we did mm-hmm. and everything. And uh, I was fortunate by the time it was all said and done um, to, to be awarded Artist of the Year four times. Mm-hmm. I'm the only guy to ever do it four times. And one of only two, I think, uh, that had ever done it three times. Al Joe, I think, is the only, the only one that's won it more than twice besides me. Mm-hmm. And Al was always a hero of mine, so to be able to get one up on is a pretty good deal. <laughs> but, uh, no, it, it was... Uh, when, when they decided to disband the organization, it really hurt. It, I took it personally because... Uh, it was uh, it was because the industry, in the opinion of the board at the time, had declined to the point where it could no longer sustain itself. And in a lot of in a lot of ways, there's some truth to that. You know, more galleries have closed than used to exist. I mean, everything ebbs and flows and. And we're talking about this in the middle of coronavirus times. Mm-hmm. You know, the world, the world next year is going to be even more different. But you know, it, it was really, uh, it was really hard to, to uh, see it stop, to see it end. You know. What year did, did it end? Oh, I can't remember now. It was about oh five years ago, I think. Oh. It hadn't been that long. Mm-hmm. But um, it was being propped up by some of its uh, wealthier members, mm-hmm. and they were doing the best they could. The biggest challenge, in my opinion, and why it was dying finally was because of lack of, lack of participation. Mm-hmm. Um, when, when we did the, uh, when we were successful in getting the Indian Arts and Craft Act changed, which I will say was one of the very first things that Obama signed when he became president. Mm-hmm. Um, when we were successful in doing that, it was uh, like I said, a lot of people that I respected and a lot of people that that I admired, I saw their true colors, and they could no longer be members of the organization. And. Uh, it was getting people, I wouldn't say people were calling people out, mm-hmm. but if you were going to continue to be part of the organization, you would have to clean up your own act. Mm-hmm. And money's a powerful thing, you know? Mm-hmm. They weren't going to give up their money. So, and. There, you know, there really aren't that many galleries, in my opinion, in my experience, that are like really legit, and and when I know them, I tell people that's where they should go spend their money, mm-hmm. and not all of them represent me, so it's not a it's not a for profit endorsement. It's <laughs> you know, I know that these in a lot of cases these people have spent you know, decades and millions of dollars to represent things right. Some of them are Mm multi-generational. And those are the most impressive. Because, I mean, when you see see a family that is two and sometimes three generations and and their passion for Indian art is so great that it gets passed from generation to generation, you know, that's that's pretty cool, Mm -hmm. you know. I mean, it happens with artists all the time. And, but to see a, a retail situation where that's the case, that's, that's, that's pretty impressive. But anyhow, that was my short answer to your long question.